Welcome to this excellent and comprehensive oil painting course by Puerto Rican artist Alejandro de Jesus. Very few painters are talented artists and good teachers at the same time. Alejandro has not only been outstanding in creating paintings which move our most intimate senses, but also in knowing how to clearly explain to his students the processes and concepts of oil painting without ambiguities. His success is due to the profound and sincere love Alejandro has had for art all his life, to his constant study of the medium, and his desire to teach all interested students. Fundamentals of oil painting include subjects on elementary, intermediate, and advanced levels. Only information and exercises that are essential for a solid start in development in oil painting have been selected. The content of this course is based on more than 60 years of experience Alejandro has had in oil painting and 28 years helping his students solve the problems of this medium. The teaching method used in this course is the same method he has used to teach so many children and adults in his studio. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Alejandro de Jesus and Oil Painting Fundamentals. Welcome to my studio. This is a place where we can spend hours in complete harmony with whatever we're painting. A place where our senses become so sharp that we forget where and who we are. Your studio can be any place in your home, where you can set up an easel and a few art materials. It's important to have one or more open windows, or doors with enough light, and good ventilation. It's also important to have a working place where you can leave your materials on site, and ready to be used, without having to relocate or put them away after every working session. The place where you work should have only one light source over the object or model for the best dramatic effect. You should also have a small table close to your easel so you can play still life objects like fruits, a pitcher or jug, flowers, or things you have in your own home. Later, you can substitute the table for a chair and have a sitting model. You can also place a mirror so you can paint your own portrait. Whenever you don't have enough natural light, you can use artificial light, fluorescent, incandescent, or a combination of both. And now we'll look at some easels, paint boxes, taborettes, and other materials. This will give you an idea of what's available on the market for your studio. A studio easel is generally a heavy wooden or aluminum piece of furniture used for holding and handling the canvas or other support which you plan to paint on. Some of the more advanced easels have a cranking system for raising and lowering the canvas. This much cheaper studio easel is lighter and simpler with a similar design. This other studio easel is very simple and easy to build at a very low cost. It has three legs attached to it with a one quarter inch bolt, washer, and butterfly nut. The French easel is not only very useful for working in the studio, but for plein air or outdoor painting as well. It's a combination adjustable easel, with three legs, and a paint box, which you can easily carry anywhere you go. This is a very cheap, aluminum, portable easel. It doesn't take up a lot of space, and can be useful whenever you want to quickly capture a fleeting image that impresses you. This combination paint box and easel has room for your brushes, paint tubes, palette, painting panels, and other materials. 
This compact pochet box is light and very convenient. It has room for paint tubes, turpentine, linseed oil, and rags. It also has a small sliding pallet. When you open it, the top holds a small canvas or board. A table or tabaret can be used for placing the pallet, brushes, knives, linseed oil, turpentine, or any other materials you need. Preferably, the stool where you sit when painting should not have armrests because they could interfere with your free movement when you're painting. Outdoor painting or plein air painting is a tremendous experience. When you paint outdoors, the sunlight provides ideal, natural illumination. If possible, select a spot, under, or to the side of a tree, shrub, or structure which can give you some shade and comfort. Now, I'll show you the types of oil painting materials available in art material stores. You only need the basics to start practicing. The oil painter's palette is a flat and light object which you place the colors on to make them available for painting. The colors are placed around the borders of the palette and the central space is left open for mixing the colors which are then applied to the canvas. Many artists do their mixing directly on the canvas. The palette can be held in one hand, together with the brushes and a rag, while you paint with the other hand. Or, it can be placed close to the easel or a table, leaving both hands free for holding the brushes and the rag. Palettes come in different forms and sizes. They are also constructed from different materials. Oil paints are pigments from mineral, plant, and animal sources, but mostly synthetics which are pulverized, diluted in linseed oil, and packaged in metal or plastic tubes. These come in hundreds of colors under many brand names. A color from one brand could look a little different from the same color's name from another brand. It's important to point out that there are differences in pigmentation opacity or transparency, drying time, and permanence among colors. There are several grades of pigmentation. Like everything, there are cheap colors, with low pigmentation and a lot of medium, or extender, while other colors are more expensive, but of higher pigmentation, therefore having stronger covering power. Even within the same brand name, some colors have a stronger covering power than others. For example, Follow Blue has a much stronger pigmentation than Ultramarine Blue. A little Follow Blue is enough to overpower a mixture. Some colors have higher viscosity and are opaque like white and yellow ochre. Others are transparent like alizarin and crimson. The drying time of oil paint varies from one color to another. Cadmium colors and alizarin crimson can take months to dry to the touch, depending on the amount of medium you use. Earth colors, like burnt umber usually dry in one or two days. It's commonly known that if you restrict the number of colors on your palette and carefully choose a few colors, you'll learn the true potential of each color. For this reason, I strongly recommend that you begin by using no more than 9 or 10 colors. I recommend starting with a palette with a cool and warm version 
of each of the three primary colors. You'll learn much more this way. The cool red should be alizarin crimson, while the warm red should be cadmium red light. The cool blue can be thalo blue and the warm blue should be ultramarine blue. The cool yellow can be yellow ochre while the warm yellow should be cadmium yellow light. Include an earth color like burnt umber for sketching and creating your initial structure, or massing. If you want, include a black color in your palette like, ivory black. I don't recommend using lamp black. It has a high oil absorption level, and if you later decide to paint over it with another color of a lesser absorption level, the painting will eventually crack over time. After you feel comfortable with this palette, you could add some secondary color like green. But, be careful not to get confused. You can mix more interesting green colors with blues and yellows with your basic palette of colors than the green colors sold in art material stores. The location of the colors on your palette can be compared to the keys on a piano. Colors must always be at the same places, on the borders of your palette. Changing color places every time you start painting is confusing. The color order on your palette must be useful and logical. I place the warm colors up from the lower left hand border and the cool colors on the upper border from left to right of my palette. Without disturbing this temperature sequence, I also try to keep a value order around the palette, from light to dark. This way, I'm always conscious of color temperatures and values. Purchase a large studio tube of white color, since you'll use it the most. There are different whites, permalba, titanium, zinc, and flake. Be careful with flake white, because it contains lead. You should keep it away from your mouth, and open wounds. I don't recommend using zinc white by itself, because it eventually gets yellowish. Finally, you can have the white color, in a special place somewhere on the lower or, right hand border of your palette. There's a large variety of brushes in art material stores. It's important that you only purchase what you need. Oil painting brushes are made out of bristle hair. The firmness of these brushes is impossible to replicate with any other type of brush. You must not skimp on brushes. Purchase the best quality brushes you can. Trying to paint with a brush whose hairs point in several directions makes what you're trying to do a lot harder. Bristle brush sizes are available from 0 to 24. There are six types of bristle brushes. This is a round brush. It is hardly ever used by today's artists. This might be because it tends to have a repetitious brush stroke. The bright brush has a square point with short hairs. The flat brush also has a square point, but with longer hairs. This brush is called an Egbert brush and has even longer hairs. It's flat, but thinner than the previous brushes. 
The fan brush is used in very special cases. My favorite is the filbert brush. This brush is a combination of the flat and round brushes. You can make brush strokes with the greatest variety and technique with it. To start with, I suggest you purchase four or five filbert type brushes, size numbers 3, 5, 6, and 8. There are other types of non-bristle hair brushes. I'll show them to you, because you might sometimes see them at art material stores. This is a sable brush. It also comes in different sizes and forms. It has very soft hairs and is more expensive than the bristle brush. It's used mostly in watercolors, but some artists use them in oils for slow transitions and delicate lines. This is a synthetic brush, used in oil painting. You can use this brush called, a round badger for some transitions and techniques. This special purpose brush, is made out of goat hair. Although, I don't favor these types of brushes before you get some skill with bristle brushes, I'll let you see them so you can get an idea of the wide variety of brushes available. At the beginning, only buy what you need. Painting knives are available in several sizes and forms. They are tools used in creating different textures and techniques that are difficult or impossible to produce with brushes. For example, to make short and fine straight lines. Some artists do whole paintings with knives. The palette knife is used to scrape off the colors of your palette after you finish your painting session. Linseed oil has a light yellowish color and is pressed from the seeds of a flax plant. This oil is preferred by most artists for diluting the oil paint when it comes out of the tube too hard and at the beginning of the painting. Linseed oil is seldom used by itself. It's usually mixed with turpentine. Sometimes a little varnish is added to this mixture. Such a mixture is called a medium. Too much linseed oil gives the painting a yellowish color. Gum spirits of turpentine is made from a pine tree distillation process. It's volatile, not greasy, and leaves no trace after drying. Turpentine can be used to dilute the first color brushstrokes, so they dry quickly. It may also be used to clean off paint from the canvas or your own clothes when the paint is still wet. Damar varnish is a tree resin sometimes added to a medium to add gloss to the colors. It can also be used mixed with gum spirits of turpentine to protect the painting when it's finished and dried. This mixture gives the final painting a hard, uniform, and glossy coating. For this reason, I recommend you use four parts turpentine to each part Damar varnish. Depending on the thickness of the colors, the painting must be finished at least one year prior to the application of the mixture. This varnish can be purchased pre-made in a spray can in art material stores. The use instructions should be followed carefully. A medium is one or more mixed ingredients added to colors, for diluting and changing their viscosity and, therefore, their handling. It can also add gloss to the painting. The classic formula for a medium, is a mixture of equal parts linseed oil, 
and gum spirits of turpentine. There are many mediums already prepared, with different ingredients, in art material stores. As you continue gaining experience in oil painting, you'll start depending less on the medium, and only use it, for restoring the proper viscosity to colors, when they come out of the tube too hard. This is a double container, clipped to the palette, that contains gum spirits of turpentine in one cup, and a medium in the other. When dipping the brush, try to keep the medium, or turpentine, as clean as possible by not touching the bottom, or the sides of the cup with your brush. At the beginning, turpentine mixed with an earth color, can be used for blocking in the initial structure of the painting. This is sometimes called, massing. I only have a single small, cup with medium, for diluting some colors, sketching, and massing. I never use turpentine alone. Artists use different painting surfaces, for oil painting. The best, most durable, and, of course, most expensive, is the traditional stretched linen canvas. Cotton canvas, is less expensive and is a good alternative. A pressed wood panel, is rigid but too heavy in large sizes. Plywood is a good choice, but is also heavy in large sizes. You might sometimes want to try cotton, or synthetic loose leaf pages. Cardboard, and paper covered with latex, are risky alternatives, due to their vulnerability to humidity, and mishandling during transportation. Remember, that oil colors, should never enter into direct contact with a canvas, because the oil will eventually rot the textile. Therefore, sizing and priming the canvas, prior to painting on it, is absolutely necessary. This process, protects the canvas against the negative effects of the oil. Although you can purchase, any painting surface already prepared at art material stores, it's a good idea, to familiarize yourself, with the conventional way of stretching a canvas on wooden stretcher bars, sizing it, and priming it. For this job, you'll need two pairs of wooden stretcher bars, a piece of string, linen or cotton canvas, a ruler, a heavy duty staple gun, a pair of pliers for stretching the canvas, glue size from animal hide, water, a two inch brush, and white primer. Assemble the wooden stretcher bars. With the piece of string, measure equal distances of diagonals, to make sure the corners of the stretcher bars are square. Another way of squaring the corners, is by placing the stretchers over a table corner, and comparing corners. Place the frame over the canvas, so the wooden strips are aligned with the horizontal and vertical weave of the canvas as nearly as possible. Measure and cut the canvas, leaving at least 2 inches of margin in excess of the frame, on each of the four sides. Fold the canvas over one, of the longer sides of the frame, and staple the canvas in the center. Fold and stretch the canvas with the pliers over the opposite side, without forcing it and staple it in the center. Repeat this process over the other two sides. The front of the folded canvas, should have a diamond shaped wrinkle, before you proceed. Keep stapling the canvas in opposite sides, from each center towards the corners. When you reach the corners, leave a space for the flaps. Each staple should be approximately 2 inches, from each other. Fold the corner flaps, and staple them, as shown. Lodge two wedges, or keys in each corner. Don't drive them in tight. If the canvas becomes slack, adjust the keys, so the canvas remains taut.
Mix 1 round tablespoon of glue size, with 7 tablespoons of water in a clean disposable glass jar. Let the contents soak in enough water, to cover for approximately 20 minutes. The glue size will absorb the water, doubling its size. Fill the jar, three quarters full of cold water, and heat gently for about 30 minutes in a double boiler, stirring occasionally, until the glue is dissolved in the water. Don't allow the size to boil, or the pan to go dry. If the size becomes too thick, you can add more water, and reheat the size. Remove the size from the heat, and apply it lukewarm to the canvas, with a 2-inch brush, working from the edge in one direction only. Work uniformly including the edges. Don't apply too much size, or scrub the brush against the canvas. Two thin coats of size are better than one thick one. If you want to give the canvas a second coat, you should let the first coat dry for several hours, lying flat. Brush on the second coat, in the opposite direction. Let it dry for several hours, before applying the primer. Oil prime the canvas in two thin coats, at right angles from each other. This primer takes at least, one month to dry. One alternative to glue size from animal hides, and to oil primer is acrylic gesso, which dries quickly. This product is sold ready-made, and can be applied directly to the canvas according to the manufacturer's instructions. You have to wait the required drying time, before you start painting on the canvas. I use acetone on rare occasions, when I want to remove oil paint which has dried on the canvas, and I don't want to paint over it because of its texture or color. Be very careful when using this liquid, and closely follow the manufacturer's warnings. A mall stick, can be any stick used as a rest for the hand, while working on a painting. It is usually used for stabilizing the hand holding the brush, while working on details. Gum spirits of turpentine, is more expensive, than raw turpentine sold in hardware stores. For this reason, it makes sense to use raw turpentine to clean your brushes and palette. Don't use raw turpentine for oil painting. Take a look at this yellowish, resinous trace left, on this can buy raw turpentine. The same thing would happen, if you mixed it with your colors. Cleaning your brushes with raw turpentine, isn't a problem because you're going to wash your brushes with soap and water afterwards. You need to prepare, a container for the raw turpentine. You should place a piece of metallic wire mesh, on the bottom of the container, so you can wipe most of the paint off your brushes. This container has to have a cap to avoid evaporation of the turpentine, when it's not being used. After each painting session, you should clean your brushes in three steps. First, wipe the large amount of paint off your brushes, with a rag or paper towel. Second, wipe your brushes softly, against the metallic wire mesh, in a container filled with raw turpentine. And third, wash your brushes with soap and water. Use a bar of soap without cream or color. You might have to wash them two or three times.
Oil paints must never come into contact with your mouth or open wounds. You should not eat while painting. Some oil colors contain lead, which could be harmful to your health if you don't handle them properly. There should be enough ventilation from one or more windows or doors when working with oil paint, turpentine, acetone, or any other vapor emitting ingredient, which could be inhaled when gathered in the air and be harmful to your health. You should always read the labels of the materials you are working with and pay close attention to the warnings. Nature has many colors, and they are beautiful. But how can we learn to organize these colors and mix them on our palette without getting confused? Let's see. When the sun's light shines through water moisture in the air, every tiny drop of water acts like a prism, breaking up the light into the spectrum of colors that forms a rainbow. At one end of the rainbow, you can see the color red, and at the other end, you can see the color violet. Under ordinary conditions, infrared and ultraviolet rays cannot be seen. In order to create color systems, we join the two ends of this rainbow and build a color wheel. Two of the best known color systems are the triadic system and the moonsel system. The triadic system is the most elementary system and consists of a wheel with three original hues called primaries, red, blue, and yellow. These colors are mixed in pairs to arrive at the three secondary hues. Red is mixed with yellow to get an orange hue. Yellow is mixed with blue to get a green hue and blue is mixed with red to get a violet hue. Then we mix each secondary hue with its primary neighbor to get tertiary hues. If we mix red with orange, we get a reddish-orange hue, or an orange-red hue. We mix orange and yellow, to get a yellowish-orange hue. Yellow and green, make yellowish-green, or a greenish-yellow hue. Green and blue, make greenish-blue, or a bluish-green hue. Blue and violet, make bluish-violet or a violet-blue hue. Violet and red, make reddish-violet, or a violet-red hue. Hues directly opposite each other on the wheel, are called, complementary colors. Therefore, red and green are complementary colors. So are violet and yellow, and orange and blue. It's important to understand that the resulting mixture will depend on the proportion of one pigment quantity to the other. It will also depend on the brand and grade of the colors you purchase. The better grade of color, the stronger its pigmentation. When the first attempts at color printing were made at the beginning of the 20th century, it was discovered that all hues could not be printed from the primaries red, yellow, and blue. A more advanced color system was created 
by Albert Munsell in 1900, and later used by Paul Clay, in 1920. Colors used in this system are cyan, which is a greenish blue, yellow, and magenta, which is a violet red. These same hues, are used in modern printers, run by computers. Hues on the Moonsell wheel are equidistant from each other, unlike the triadic system, where some hues jump from one to the other without a consistent transition between adjacent hues. Another advantage of the Moonsell system is that complementary colors are more precise. Orange and blue, yellow and bluish violet. Red and cyan or greenish blue. Violet and yellowish green. Magenta or reddish violet and green. A complementary color is a visual phenomenon that influences your sight when you look at a particular color for approximately 30 seconds and then look at another colored surface. There, you will easily be able to see the first color's complement. Let's see. If you observe this yellow disc for 30 seconds, or longer, you'll see the phenomenon I'm talking about. Don't look elsewhere. Keep looking at the yellow disc. Yellow's complementary color is, bluish-violet. You will start seeing bluish-violet vibrating around the yellow disc. Now, look at this white surface. Here, you will see yellow's complementary color, bluish-violet, more clearly for a few seconds. This phenomenon is called successive imaging. A color's complement influences its neighboring color. If, instead of white, such a surface were another color, bluish-violet would mix optically with that color. This vibrating phenomenon was used extensively in the second half of the 19th century during French Impressionism, especially in Pointillism by Georges Seurat and Paul Signac. Color has three properties, hue, value, or tone, and intensity, or chroma. So far, I've been talking about colors as if they only had a single property. I've referred to red, yellowish green, and blue. This is called a color's hue. But, color also has value, or tone, and intensity, or chroma. Value, or tone refers to how light, or dark a color is. Here, we see two blue hues, but the hue on the right, has a lighter value than the hue on the left. Here, we see two red hues, but the hue on the left, has a lighter value than the hue on the right. Here, we have two different hues, one yellow, and one blue, but we know that the yellow hue's value, is lighter than the blue hue's value. We can see here, that the red hue's value is lighter than the blue's. Whenever you find it difficult to distinguish values of different colors, try squinting your eyes so that hues are blurred and grayed. It will be easier this way. What difference do you see here? 
The hues are different, but the values are the same. There are nine values for each hue on the Moonsel wheel, and each value has its equivalent value around the wheel. Studying color values is extremely important in oil painting, because it determines the structure or composition of the painting. Even from far away, the first thing you see in a painting is the distribution of values. We might not be able to see if the subject matter is a tree, a person, or a building wall, or whether the subject's hue is violet, red, or brown. But, we can be sure that the subject has a dark, middle, or light value, and we're either attracted to or not attracted to its composition. The other color property is intensity or chroma. Intensity is how bright or gray a color is. Here, we see mixtures of color gradations where intensity is lowered from left to right until the colors have turned gray. Observe that hues and values have remained constant. Only the intensity has changed from bright to gray. We can observe this decrease of intensity in nature when we compare closer objects to ones farther away. In this landscape, compare the higher intensity of closer hues to the lower intensity of distant hues. Closer vegetation has a brighter yellowish ochre green hue. Farther away, we can see vegetation losing some of its yellowish hue and changing to a lower intensity green. Even farther, the vegetation no longer has any yellow in it and changes to a very low intensity blue hue. At the same time, these changes in hues are taking place with greater distance the intensity is lowered so much that blues turn gray with light values in the distant mountains. These changes are due to air, humidity, dust, and other matter in the atmosphere that our eyes must see through. These changes are more dramatic on cloudy and rainy days. It's important not to confuse intensity with value. Remember that a hue can have a light value and low intensity at the same time. This orange hue has a higher intensity than the yellow hue, even though the yellow hue is lighter in value. Here, we can see a red hue changing its value vertically and changing its intensity horizontally. These exercises help fix in our minds the three properties of color. Colors have the most intensity when they come out of the paint tubes. Their intensity decreases when you start mixing them with other colors. Even hues of flowers and fruits rarely have such intensity requiring unmixed paint straight from the tube. We might think that these apples have the highest intensity, red hue, and would have to use pure red paint straight from the tube and directly onto the canvas. But that's not the case. Now, compare the apple's red hue intensity with a higher intensity of this red disc. Comparisons like this help us more easily evaluate differences in color intensities. Of course, use of this color property depends on your concept. I'll talk about concept in later parts of this course. The best way to learn how colors from your paint tubes behave is by mixing them in a particular order. 
I suggest you prepare for middle value gray surfaces to create color gradations on. With a carbon pencil, draw a pair of parallel lines about 2 inches apart. Mix the three primary colors, cadmium red light, ultramarine blue, and cadmium yellow light to get a dark color very close to black. With a number 6 filbert brush, pick up some of this very dark color and make a vertical stroke on the left end, between the lines. Add a little white paint to the mixture with your painting knife and make another stroke next to the first stroke. Add a little more white paint and make another stroke next to the second stroke. Keep adding white paint to the mixture while making additional strokes, and trying to create a value gradation with equidistant jumps between values. You should make at least 9 values. You can label this transition, scale of grays with the three primaries. Clean your brush with a rag, or paper towel before proceeding to the next surface. You might have to wash the brush with turpentine, so the next color doesn't get contaminated. On the second surface, prepare three pairs of parallel lines two inches apart. On the first pair, you will have mixtures of the complementary colors, green and red. Make the first brush stroke without adding white color. Then, keep adding a small amount of white color with each brush stroke, until you get a scale from the darkest value to the lightest one. You should make at least nine values, and reach a very light value. In the same way, make the second value scale from the complementary colors blue and orange, and the third value scale from the complementary colors, violet and yellow. Label these, scales from the complements. On the third surface, prepare three pairs of parallel lines, two inches apart. The first pair is for a scale, from green to red. Do not add white paint to these mixtures. The second pair is for a scale, from blue to orange, and the last pair for a scale, from violet to yellow. Label these scales, complementary colors. On the last surface, prepare three pairs of parallel lines, two inches apart. Make the first scale, from red to yellow. Do not add white paint to these mixtures either. The second scale will be, from red to blue. And the last scale, from blue to yellow oil paint. Label these scales, analogous colors. The color wheel is divided in two halves, or color sections. The color section covering red, orange, and yellow is commonly called warm colors because, when we see them, they give us a conscious, or unconscious sensation related to fire, blood, and other objects we identify with such temperatures. The color section covering green, blue, and violet is commonly called cool colors. When we see them, we relate them to things like the sea, vegetation, the sky, and other objects we identify with such temperatures. When colors are light valued, warm colors appear to come forward or advance toward us, while cool colors appear to go back or recede from us. When colors are dark valued, the opposite is true. Warm colors recede, while cool colors advance. Of course, all of this depends on what the neighboring colors are. There is a temperature range between these two general classifications of warm and cool colors.
Any hue can be made warmer or cooler with its adjacent hue on the color wheel. Observe the yellow hue in the center, which was made cooler toward its left, with a green hue of the same value as the yellow hue, while it was made warmer towards the right, with an orange hue of the same value as the yellow hue. Knowing different types of color contrasts is very useful. A simultaneous contrast occurs when we change the background hue's value which there is some color shape on. Here, an orange hue on a dark background seems lighter in value than an orange hue on a light background, even though both orange hues are identical. So, if we want to change a hue's value, we can do it directly or indirectly by changing its background value. Observe this simultaneous contrast on every stripe, where darker values make the lighter values even lighter and lighter values make the darker values even darker. Knowledge of complementary colors in oil painting is essential. In a complementary color contrast, we place two complementary colors next to each other, to obtain the greatest possible vibration. Each hue influences its neighboring hue with its complementary hue, thus enhancing it further, since it already is its own complement. Remember, a hue influences its neighboring hue with its complement. Here, in spite of the fact that both central hues are identical greens, the green that has a yellow background seems bluish, because it's influenced by a blue-violet hue, which is the yellow background's complement. The green that has a violet background gets influenced by yellow, which is violet's complement, therefore looking like a yellowish green. However, when two complementary colors are physically mixed, they tend to cancel each other out, resulting in grade colors. In a warm cool contrast, a cool hue is placed next to a warm hue. In a saturation contrast, two neighboring colors have the same hue but different values. One of the questions which students ask the most is, how to mix the color of human skin? It's true that this color varies a great deal depending on the particular person's skin color and complexion. But in general, a basic Caucasian skin color is a middle value orange, of low intensity. For a darker skin color, you can add a little burnt umber. If the skin is lighter, use more white. You can modify this basic color as you gain experience, and observe changes related to light source, atmosphere, and influence from neighboring colors. The best way to mix a particular color is to consider each of the three color properties separately and to adjust the mixture until you arrive at the desired color. Let's start with the first color property, the color's hue. Let's say you want to mix this skin color. Looking at the color wheel, we notice that the closest hue to this skin color is within the orange color family. With a little practice, you will have the color wheel memorized. You can start by mixing cadmium yellow light and cadmium red light. You can do it if you want but I'll warn you that the orange hue's intensity you will get, will be very high. Cadmium yellow light's intensity is very high, and so is cadmium red light's.
When you look at the colors available on your palette, you realize that orange can also be mixed from yellow ochre and cadmium red light. Yellow ochre's intensity is much lower than cadmium yellow lights, and it begins to lower cadmium red light's intensity. In fact, you'll see that we'll have to lower this mixture's intensity even more. Alizarin Crimson is a violet red hue and I don't think you want to use it in this mixture. You'll gain this type of experience with practice. Now, we'll take a look at the second property of color, value. Since the orange hue we just mixed has a darker value than the skin color's value we want to mix, we have to add a little white. When you want to mix a very light color value, I recommend you start with white, and add other colors afterwards. It's a very common mistake among students, to mix two colors first and then find out afterwards that they have to use a lot of white to lighten the resulting mixture's value. Starting with white is more practical. Of course, once you have experience with color proportions, you can add small amounts of the two colors, and then add white to the mixture. This is a good way to avoid wasting paint. Finally, let's take a look at the last color property, intensity. Notice that the intensity of the color we just mixed on the palette is higher than the intensity of the skin color we want to mix. In other words, the skin color we mixed is more alive or brighter than the color we want. In order to lower the intensity of the mixed color, you can add a little of orange's complementary color, blue. When you mix colors located across from each other, on the color wheel, they tend to gray, or cancel each other out. This lowers the mixture's intensity. Although, you can later experiment with thalo blue, it has a strong tinting power, and is cooler than ultramarine blue. We add a little bit of ultramarine blue to the mixture very little and see what happens. Notice that when we add ultramarine blue, we not only lower the mixture's intensity, but also darken its value, because blue's value is darker. In this exercise, we've seen that when you change one property in a color mixture, you might also change the other two properties. With practice, you'll learn how to manage these interactions. Also, it's important to note that it's always good practice to mix some version of the three primary colors in unequal proportions in a hierarchy so to speak in order to obtain harmony among hues. It's a good idea to leave a trace of the original colors around the mixture so you don't lose track of what you're doing and to keep control of the mixture. An easier way of lowering a mixture's intensity, without affecting its value, is by separately mixing black and white, making a gray color the same value as the mixture. When you mix black and white, try to match the resulting value to the value of the mixture whose intensity you want to lower. In order to compare values, every time you lighten or darken the gray value, Pick some of it up with your brush or knife, and without touching the mixture on your palette, place your brush or knife over it. Squint your eyes, and visualize the point at which the two values seem to visually blend, or fuse together. Before mixing gray into the mixture, make sure both have a similar value.
Notice that the resulting black and white mixture is a cool gray that belongs to the blue color family. If you want to mix a warm gray, you can add a little warm hue that belongs to the red, orange, or yellow families. If you want a neutral gray, just mix a cool gray and a warm gray. Very shortly, you should be able to distinguish color temperatures. Even though this method of adjusting color intensity doesn't produce colors as chromatic as the ones made with complements, it's a good alternative. You might like it. Art material stores have a lot of gray and earth colors, but you'll learn much faster if you practice mixing them with your basic palette colors. Look at all the color mixtures I've been able to make by combining two, three, and four colors. When you mix more than three or four colors, you risk producing what's called mud. Mud is a lifeless gray mixture without luminosity. This is generally not good. It's very important to practice making mixtures such as these, because you'll learn about the potential of your palette colors and have control over your palette. With practice you'll be able to mix colors intuitively with little effort. You should get used to evaluating and comparing the three color properties, hue, value and intensity in every subject around you. Nature has many colors, but learning these principles will help you mix them all on your palette. You'll soon start thinking like an artist.